What's up everybody? Welcome to another video and I hope you're ready to flex those brain muscles. In this video I'm going to establish or verify some trigonometric identities as well as just share some general tips for strategies for approaching establishing these identities. So I'm going to do four examples and what I've done is I've put these four examples into a worksheet that I put in the description below and what I highly recommend doing is checking out this worksheet and trying to establish some of these identities on your own. Challenge yourself, see if you can do it, and then come back to this video to compare your work with my work. And at the end of the day, I really think that is the best way to get really good at establishing these identities is just by doing a bunch of examples. And the reason why is because there's not one set procedure that you can use to establish every identity. They're all different, and not only that, but there's multiple different ways to establish each identity. Right? So it's hard to just teach you it. You really have to dive into examples and figure out what works for you on your own. But I will share some things that work for me pretty well just through experience and doing hundreds of these establishing identities problems. But without further ado, let's jump into this first example. And since this is the first example, I want to talk a little bit about what exactly it is we're doing here. What does it mean to establish an identity? Well, what we're given here is a statement, right? That these two things are equal. And what it means to establish this identity is basically just to prove it, show that these two things are in fact equal. And how we can do that is we can take one side of the equation, so either the left side or the right side, and we can use algebra as well as identities that we know are true. So like reciprocal identity, Pythagorean, half angle, double angle, all these identities that we know are true. We can use a combination of those things and modify either the left side or the right side until we get exactly what's on the other side of the equation. And by doing that, we have shown that these two things are indeed equal, and we have therefore established the identity. So that's the general idea. Pick one side, either the left or right, modify it using algebra and identities until you get exactly what's on the other side. And as a general tip, I like to pick the side that looks more complicated. And the reason why is because from my experience, it's a lot easier to go from more complicated to less complicated than it is to go the other way around. So both sides will always work. You can always use either side, but sometimes one side is a little easier to work with than the other. And you'll see what I mean in the next couple of examples. For this example, they're actually both equally as complicated, so we can really work with either side. I'm going to work with this right side here. And the first thing I'm going to do is factor. We have a common factor of tangent squared theta. So I'm gonna factor tangent squared theta out in front here. And what I'm left with is tangent squared theta times tangent squared theta plus one. And now what I wanna start thinking about is, and this is something that I highly recommend doing, as you're going along, think about what the end goal is. We want expressions with secant in them, right? And be thinking about how can I relate tangent to secant? And a clear relationship between tangent and secant, I'll write it off to the side here, is this Pythagorean identity. 1 plus tangent squared theta equals secant squared theta. And since we do have tangent squareds in both of our terms here, we can. it should be a good hint that we're probably going to use this Pythagorean theorem, uh, sorry, Pythagorean identity at least once, right? But that is a good idea to do. As you're going along, make sure that what you're doing makes sense. Uh, with what you're wanting to end up with. Hopefully that makes sense, but um, we can replace tangent squared theta plus one directly with secant squared theta. So we're left with now is tangent squared theta times secant squared theta. And now since we want everything in terms of secant, all we need to do is replace tangent squared theta with what? Well, one plus tangent squared theta equals secant squared theta. So if I just subtract one from both sides of this equation, I get tangent squared theta equals secant squared theta minus one. So I can replace tangent squared theta with secant squared theta minus one. And don't be ashamed of having to write out your identities and manipulate them. Do it off to the side like I'm doing as sort of scratch work. That's totally fine. There's no shame in doing that. I still do it today. I still forget the identities from time to time, actually. Uh, so I can replace this with secant squared theta minus one. And now when I have a secant squared theta minus one times secant squared theta, and now if I multiply this out, I get exactly what it is that I'm trying to get. I get secant to the fourth theta minus secant squared theta. And so what have I done here? I factored, so that's my algebra step. Then I used an identity, and then I used another identity, 
and then I multiply. So algebra, identity, identity, algebra, and we have shown that this tangent to the fourth theta plus tangent squared theta is equal to secant to the fourth theta minus secant squared theta, and that's what it means to establish an identity. All right, so here's our next example, and again, as a general tip, I like to work with the more complicated side of the equation and try to modify that to make it look like the other side. So I'm going to choose this right side because this fraction looks a lot more complicated than this left side where we just have two single terms. Uh, so I'm going to take this right side and work with that. And this is where I'm going to introduce one of the tricks that I've learned works really well just throughout my hundreds of examples of doing these, and that is something called the conjugate. So if you're not familiar with what the conjugate is, we essentially keep the two terms the same and we just take the opposite sign between them. But what I like to do, especially when I have these one plus sine, one minus sine, one plus cosine kind of deals, is I like to multiply by the conjugate over the conjugate. So I multiply by the conjugate over itself. And the reason why this works so well is because let's look what we're gonna end up with in the denominator here. One plus sine times one minus sine. If we foil this out, we end up with one minus sine squared theta, which is equal to cosine squared theta by the Pythagorean identity, right? And so what I've done is I've taken these two terms and I've made them a single term with a cosine in it that will most likely cancel with my numerator here. So it doesn't always work, but a lot of times it works and it works really well. And you can get what you're looking for pretty quickly by using this conjugate. So just thought I'd introduce this little trick. But if we multiply this out, we get cosine theta and I'm actually not going to distribute that. I'm going to let it hang out in front because I have a feeling that that's going to cancel. So if I distribute it, I'm going to have to just factor it back out, which is like doing extra work, if that makes sense. And then again, this one plus sine theta times one minus sine theta. If I foil that out, I end up with one minus sine squared theta, which is equal to cosine squared theta by the Pythagorean identity. Right? Essentially what I've done is I've taken that Pythagorean identity and subtracted sine squared theta from both sides. And you get cosine squared theta equals one minus sine squared theta. So that's gonna be my next step. I should be using maybe equal signs here to be more clear. Cosine theta times one minus sine theta over cosine squared theta. And now we can see why this worked out so nicely. It's because this cosine squared theta is gonna cancel with this whole cosine theta. And we're left with a single cosine in the denominator. So I'm gonna need some extra room here. So I'm gonna come over here. This equals one minus sine theta over cosine theta. So it still may look a little complicated, but what's nice about this is we have a single term in the denominator so we can split this apart, right? We can write this as one over cosine theta minus sine theta over cosine theta, and then maybe you can already see how it's gonna give us what we want here. Because if I rewrite it that way, one over cosine theta minus sine theta over cosine theta, now I can just use identities to get exactly what it is I want. Because secant theta is equal to one over cosine theta, and tangent theta is equal to sine over cosine. So I have secant theta, I meant to write a minus there, minus tangent theta, and that's exactly what I wanted to end up with, okay? So I definitely recommend trying out this uh, conjugate, see if it works well for you. A lot of times it works really well in certain examples and it makes your life a little bit easier. Again, there are a bunch of different ways to establish these identities, but I like using this conjugate a lot, especially with examples like this. So with this example, it's pretty clear as to which side is more complicated, right? Clearly, it's this left-hand side where we have these two complicated-looking fractions. And on the right-hand side here, we just have a simple 2 times secant theta. So I'm going to work with this left-hand side. And this is where my next tip slash strategy advice comes into play, I guess. And that is combining fractions by finding a common denominator. Right? So we're going to find a common denominator between these two fractions, combine them, and then hopefully some things will simplify and it will come out nicely to be 2 secant theta. And this works a lot with examples like this, where you have two fractions on one side and then kind of a simple thing on the other side. Usually just by finding that common denominator and combining the fractions, you can do some simplifying and get exactly what you want. And we're going to see how it works right now. So if we find a common denominator, let's see, what is our common denominator? Well. These denominators, as is, have nothing in common, so it's actually just gonna be the product of the two. It's gonna be cosine 
theta times one minus sine theta. That is our common denominator. So that means we need to multiply this first term by one minus sine over one minus sine, and the second term by cosine over cosine. So when we multiply this first term, what do we get in the numerator? Well, we get one minus sine times itself, right? So I'm gonna write that as one minus sine theta, the whole thing squared. Plus, well here it's a little simpler, we just get cosine squared theta. So now what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna multiply this out because I see that there's a negative sine theta in there. And once I multiply this out, I'm gonna end up with a sine squared theta, which I can combine with cosine squared theta and replace sine squared theta plus cosine squared theta with one. And then maybe it'll become simpler and it'll be clearer to see what I'm gonna do next from there. But you should always be kind of looking ahead, thinking about your identities and which identities you can use. So from here, if I do multiply this out, I end up with, let's see, one times one, that gives me one, and then minus sine theta and another minus sine theta, so that's minus two sine theta, and then a negative sine theta times negative sine theta, that's plus sine squared theta, and then I still have a plus cosine squared theta out here at the end, so we are gonna see that these I can replace with one, and this is still all over cosine theta times one minus sine theta. So I think I'm just gonna go ahead and replace these with one. Um, and if I do that, let's see, I'm gonna actually erase because I'm running out of board space. Sine squared theta plus cosine th squared theta is equal to one by our Pythagorean identity, right? So now we have one minus two sine theta plus one, so I can combine my like terms, my two constants here, and I get one plus one, that's equal to two. Right? So let's go ahead and combine those. I'm doing this all in the same step because I have limited board space here. Two. So now let me shift this over real quick. Okay, so after we've used our Pythagorean identity and replaced sine squared theta plus cosine squared theta with one and then combine like terms, this is what we end up with. Now what I'm gonna do is factor out a two from this numerator, because if I do that, I'll end up with two times one minus sine theta in parentheses, which I have down here, and I can cancel those two things pretty nicely. So this equals two times one minus sine theta over cosine theta times one minus sine theta. And now I can cancel these pretty nicely. And now I have two over cosine theta, which is equal to two secant theta by reciprocal identity, right? And if you don't quite see it, you can bring the two out in front and write it as two times one over cosine. We know that one over cosine is secant, so we simply have two times secant theta, which is exactly what we wanted to show, and we are done. So hopefully you make use of this common denominator combining fractions suggestion but as we can see, it wasn't too bad. It worked out pretty nicely. All we had to do was some multiplication, use a couple of identities, and we were good. So here's our last example. And again, it's pretty clear as to which side is more complicated. It's the left side here. And that's the side I'm gonna work with. And this is when I'm gonna introduce my next and last strategy tip. And that is to rewrite everything in terms of sine and cosine. And when this strategy works the best are with examples like this, where we have everything in terms of sine and cosine on one side, and on the other side we have everything in terms of like tangent, cotangent, secant, cosecant, then it works pretty well. And it also works pretty well as like a last resort. Like maybe you've tried using the conjugate, you've tried getting a common denominator, it's not working out. Rewrite everything in terms of sine and cosine, it may be a little more tedious, but it almost always works, okay? So that's what we're gonna do with this example. Tangent is sine over cosine, Cotangent is cosine over sine, so I'm going to rewrite everything in terms of sine and cosine. So I know it looks pretty crazy right now, but I promise it's going to work out really nicely. Next, what we're going to have to do, though, is use our last strategy, which is find a common denominator. And we're going to do that in this whole numerator here, as well as this denominator here. Combine each of those into a single fraction, then we're going to take the bottom and flip it and multiply it across, and hopefully it will simplify nicely to get us 
what we want. So let's go ahead and find that common denominator. As we can see, these denominators don't share anything in common, so we can just take the product of the two, and that's gonna be our common denominator. And it's gonna be the same down here as well. Actually, the only difference between these two expressions is the plus and the minus, right? So what this is gonna to equal to is, up here in the numerator, we're gonna have sine theta times cosine theta, that's our common denominator. And to get that common denominator, we need to multiply the first term by sine theta over sine theta, which is gonna give us sine squared theta, and the second term by cosine theta over cosine theta, which is gonna give us cosine squared theta. So that's our entire expression here in the numerator. And as we can see, our denominator is going to actually be the same thing. The only difference is that we're gonna have a plus, right? We're gonna multiply this by sine over sine, that's gonna give us sine squared theta, cosine over cosine, that's cosine squared theta. The only difference is the plus. So we're gonna end up with sine squared theta plus cosine squared theta over, and the same denominator, again, sine theta times cosine theta. So now what we can do is we can multiply by the reciprocal of this over itself, right? Or you could think of it as flipping and multiplying, however you choose to think of it. But what we can notice is we have this sine squared theta plus cosine squared theta here. And that's an identity. That equals one, right? So what we really have then is, let me go ahead and write, let's see, I'll draw a line here. Let me go ahead and write sine squared theta minus cosine squared theta over sine theta cosine theta. And then when I take this bottom and flip it and multiply across, as well as use my Pythagorean identity, remember this whole thing is equal to one. So what I really have here is sine theta times cosine theta over sine squared theta plus cosine squared theta, which is one. And now you see how nicely this works out. This cancels with this. We're left with sine squared theta minus cosine squared theta, which is exactly what we wanted to show, all right? So I did kind of two steps at once there because I was running out of board space. Typically, you'd want to write out each step one at a time. But hopefully that makes sense. A lot of times rewriting in terms of sine and cosine, it may look scary at first, but it works out really nicely pretty quickly. All right, so to finish up this video, I'll just quickly summarize some of the general strategies that I use for establishing trigonometric identities. So the first strategy, work with the more complicated side. This is a little bit subjective. Sometimes they both look kind of equally as complicated, but sometimes it's obvious, like we saw with some of our examples. So I always pick the more complicated side to work with because in my experience, I find it's easier going from more complicated to less complicated than it is to go the other way around. Factor, pretty self-explanatory. You factor so you can cancel things out, so you can simplify. Use the conjugate, we saw that with our second example. It's pretty useful. Combining fractions, we saw that with examples three and four. And rewrite everything in terms of sine and cosine, we saw that in example four. So these are sort of strategies that I have in my establishing identities toolkit, as I like to think of it, that I'm able to pull out whenever I see fit. But at the end of the day, if you really want to get good at establishing identities, you just got to work out a bunch of examples, get a bunch of practice, and maybe come up with your own general strategies that work best for you. But hope this video helped you prepare for your quiz or exam. Uh, leave any comments below. I'm happy to respond to any questions. Like and subscribe if you enjoyed. But most importantly, keep flexing those brain muscles. See y'all later.